Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Growth Chat. We are very delighted to have Professor Timo Kuran from Duke University with us today. It's a first for us in the sense that it's the second time we have him on the podcast. Uh, some months ago, we talked about, about one of his research papers. And today it's about his latest book that's called Freedoms Delayed political legacies of Islamic law in the Middle East. And welcome, Timur. Welcome back. Well, good to see you again. I enjoyed the first podcast and uh, I'm honored that you've invited me again. Yeah, thanks for coming. So some of your major works have tended to be organized around a central puzzle. And so the question is your current book, what's the puzzle you are grappling with? Uh, so the central puzzle is that the Middle East is the world's least free region. The book defines the Middle East as consisting of the Arab world plus Iran plus uh, Turkey. Now, many observers claim that the Middle East's main religion, Islam, explains the observed repression. Islam rejects basic human rights, say some observers or Islam seeks to control every aspect of human uh, life, crushing individuality, or Islam is wedded to medieval values such as the control of women by male relatives. A related claim is that Islam is an inherently conservative religion incapable of liberalization. Now at best, these are incomplete as explanations for the Middle East's repressiveness today. Take Islamic conservatism. It's easy to find examples of clerical opposition to innovation or adaptation. But that's true of every major religion, especially over long time periods. Besides, Muslim ruled societies have been remarkably receptive to certain reforms in the past. In the 19th century, Egypt and Turkey, uh, in Egypt and Turkey, fundamental tax reforms and financial reforms, among other reforms, encountered almost no resistance, even when they violated Islamic law. For every recent innovation, one can find clerics who have declared it's forbidden to Muslims. This happened with the credit card, to give one example. A credit card is a financial instrument that involves charging interest on unpaid uh, balances, and interest is sinful according to many interpretations of Islam. Yet in 2023, Muslims everywhere use credit cards. Clerics who kicked up a storm early on use credit cards themselves. It's become a non-issue. They've had no trouble developing supposedly Islamic credit cards that charge interest under the guise of service fees. Now, here we have a case of an initial conservative reaction in the name of Islam, but the pushback dissipates. Yes, Islamic officials still resist certain forms of liberalization, and sometimes the pushback persists, but conservatism is not effective across the board. The book's challenge is to explain why, in specific respects, Middle Easterners are relatively repressed by global standards. Let's turn to another common uh, explanation for the Middle East's uh, repressiveness, that Islam aims to control every aspect of human life. This is an ideal, that's true. But never has it become reality. In practice, lots of freedoms are granted, sometimes uh, by default, and sometimes freedoms are granted because the masses acting as individuals ignore bans issued in the name of Islam. With credit cards, people's economic incentives overwhelm religious concerns, and the clerics just accepted defeat and moved on. Another reason uh, why Islam per se doesn't explain the book's master puzzle is that in its first millennium, Islam did not stand out as particularly repressive among the world's religions. 
I can't back this up with standardized global indices as I can for the, for the present. But there's no reason to believe that Islam was always more repress repressive than, let's say, Christianity. If anything, at least until the 1750s, it was probably less repressive in an important sense. The movement of religious renegades was overwhelmingly, and this is between the, the Middle East and, and Europe, was overwhelmingly from the West to the Middle East, not the other way around. Today, Middle Easterners seek asylum in Europe to escape religious uh, repression, and that's in line, of course, with uh, uh, comparisons of standardized indices. 25% of the region's adults would instantly emigrate, the vast majority to the West, if they could, many because of persecution of one form or another, the global average is 15%. Uh, now, this podcast audience may infer that it's Islam that people are escaping from, but the Middle East stands out as particularly repressive even within the broader Muslim world. Pick any major global index of freedoms, for instance, the Civil Liberties Index of Freedom House or some Religious Freedoms Index, there are uh, quite a few, invariably the Middle East performed substantially worse, not only than the global average, but also substantially worse than the rest of the Muslim world. Evidently, Islam can't, or Islam per se, can't explain why the Middle East which houses roughly one quarter of all Muslims, why it's an outlier, outlier even within the broader Muslim world, where three quarters of the world's Muslims live. So to wrap up, the central puzzle of freedoms delayed is that the Middle East was not particularly unfree even a couple of centuries ago, but now it is strikingly unfree. Thank you, Timur. So you already touched a little bit on, on this part, but I'm curious to know, um, you know, there was a shift from the Middle East to uh, Europe over the years as center of the world. And what has made the Middle East unusually uh, repressive? So historically, uh, around the, the world, there have been many sustained liberalization episodes. No two of these, no two liberalization processes look identical, but all of them share two features. First, they involve pushes from below by privately organized constituencies that stand up to the state, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps the church uh, or, or some other religion. They constrain the state, constrain uh, 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 churches, and uh, they influence priorities of these uh, major institutions. Second, ideological constraints on individuals weaken, allowing them to break intellectual taboos and start thinking outside the box. This ideological and intellectual relaxation involves invariably religious liberalization. Now, these two factors were central to European liberalization processes. All liberalization drives, whether you were looking at France or England or, or uh, somewhere else in, in Europe, they involved the strengthening of civil society. In other words, of associations formed outside uh, the state uh, of non-governmental organizations, NGOs that give voice to specific private constituencies. And all the drives involved a political weakening of the church and clerical influence, along with greater religious uh, uh, tolerance. These two features common to liberalization drives outside the Middle East are essentially absent within it until modern times. So freedoms delayed asks why. So the book's analytic strategy is to go back historically 
to a time when the critical features were absent everywhere and to focus on the institutions that would have mattered to their development and then explain why the Middle East got itself on a trajectory that has lagged in liberalization. Now, it turns out that institutional choices made more than a millennium ago in the Middle East shaped the development of Islamic law in ways that produced persistent and unintended consequences for uh, liberalization. So here's the argument. A universal challenge is to bind state officials who exercise power over uh, the people. Relatively free modern societies now bind their governments through formal institutions like periodic elections and checks and balances among branches of government. Uh, before such formal instruments, societies were already constraining rulers through civil society and civil society contributes to the uh, uh, constraining to the binding of, of rulers even today in an important uh, way. Civic organizations standing between the state and the individual served to one degree or another as barriers to despotism. If the state trampled on liberties, various associations would help people resist in an organized way. Wherever civil society strengthened, state officials started showing restraint in anticipation of powerful reactions. Now, until the modern era, civil society was anemic in the Middle East. It's stronger now, but it remains very weak by global uh, standards, uh, for example, by the indices of civicus. This is a fundamental reason why autocratic governance is the, the norm in the region. It's also why when a dictator is uh, toppled, the result is generally another dictatorship. The Egyptian revolution of 2011 overthrew uh, Mubarak. Soon, Egypt had another dictator, Sisi. Uh, few private organizations constrain him. Uh, they're all very weak. Now, why has civil society in the Middle East remained toothless? It could be for lack of private resources or private organizations. However, on the contrary, enormous resources flowed into an Islamic form of the trust, the waqf. And the waqf was a trust, type of trust, established to finance in perpetuity services designated by its founder. It was independent of the, the state. As an NGO, it was, it was a possible starting point for a strong civil society. In theory, WACFs could have used their financial base, enormous financial base, partly to constrain the state and advance their constituents' freedoms. The resulting decentralization of power might have placed the Middle East on the road to liberalization. However, WACs were rigid organizations and their functions were limited to providing services permissible under Islamic law. Engaging in politics was not among their permissible functions, courts that supervise them could uh, uh, could go after them if they uh, entered uh, politics. They couldn't form coalitions with other walks, let alone mergers to build political clout through scales, through larger scale, say. Until the modern era, the walk was the Middle East's primary instrument for providing social services privately. The trust existed in pre-modern Europe as well, but in Europe, much more important than the trust was the nonprofit corporation already in the Middle Ages. A nonprofit corporation is overseen by a board that has powers that a WAPS caretaker lacks.
the walk in the pre-modern Middle East and the corporation and pre-modern Europe provided analogous services. Mosques were established as walks, European churches as corporations. Middle Eastern uh, uh, colleges, madrasas were established as walks, European universities as corporations. In the Middle East, urban services were provided by hundreds of walks, each independent of, of the other, each autonomous. In Europe, cities organized as corporations provided social services. Unlike mosques, madrasas, and urban, urban walks, churches, universities, and European cities participated in politics. They formed coalitions with each other through struggles led by entities organized as corporations, universities, cities, religious orders, and more guilds. Western Europe liberalized in fits and starts. These corporations demanded rights. They challenged rulers as collectivities. They developed ideologies and institutions that strengthened personal and associational rights, a virtuous circle formed. As civil society strengthened, ci civic organizations took steps to facilitate establishing and securing private organizations. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, a vicious circle was in operation. The Waqf kept civil society weak for the reasons I gave, that limited the advancement of individual freedoms. It perpetuated autocracy. Strong NGOs could not develop. NGOs found it hard to challenge rulers through organized collective action. Significantly, over more than a millennium, walks fostered no political movements at all and developed no ideologies very sharp contrast with, uh, uh, with Europe, given the contributions of uh, many of the, their uh, analogous organizations in Europe to developing uh, the ideologies of liberalization and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, political movements that led to liberalization. Starting in the 1700s, in stages, the region's modernization campaigns swept away the Islamic Waqf. By the 1950s, the vast majority had been nationalized or uh, privatized. Meanwhile, starting in the early 20th century, it became possible to form nonprofit corporations. Quite in the Middle East then start to uh, liberalize why, even though it had been centuries since legal obstacles to forming self-governing organizations uh, uh, have been removed, why does civic engagement remain weak by global standards? Well, approximate reason is that autocracies deliberately undermine NGOs, but states succeed in keeping power and they remain so powerful over NGOs precisely because NGOs are, uh, are weak. That weakness is a legacy of the Islamic Waqf. Most protests of the Arab Spring brought together masses unaffiliated with any political organization. Very few NGOs were involved in the Arab Spring protests. These two are manifestations of a weak civil uh, society. The skills to form politically effective private associations to conduct the negotiations that private organizations uh, and the coalition building that private organizations uh, spearhead, all these take time to uh, develop. The atomistic nature of Arab oppositions is a key reason why the political liberalizations brought about by the Arab Spring revolutions were short-lived and they weren't sustainable. The WAC's long-term political impact manifests itself also in the absence or limited impact of domestically developed ideologies promoting 
in liberalization in the Middle East. Remember that Islamic colleges were established as waqfs. These colleges kept their curricula essentially fixed through specifications included in their deeds. Over time, outdated curricula made higher education essentially irrelevant to real social challenges. And that's among the reasons why madrasa graduates, the intellectual elites at uh, one point uh, for many centuries in the region, were ill-equipped to develop new ideologies. Observers who treat Islamic institutions as a hindrance to intellectual progress usually aren't thinking about the waqf though. In neglecting the Middle East organizational history, they overlook, I think, an elephant in the room. What they see instead is religious repression, punishments for apostasy, blasphemy, heresy, uh, or some other uh, religious offense. These are important complementary factors, though they work in tandem with the organizational handicaps I've summarized. Even now, Middle Easterners get punished for religious offenses. In most Middle Eastern countries, exit from Islam, in other words, out conversion, remains banned in practice. The state will prevent a Muslim-born person from leaving Islam. Other religious freedoms are also limited by today's uh, global standards. Egyptian bloggers have been jailed for criticizing religious curricula. As in the past, the fear of getting accused of religious offense constrains political discourses. It deflects attention from repression harmful to productivity. It protects monopolies. It weakens prospects for mass mobilizations aimed at institutional change. Historically, of course, apostasy bans and heresy charges were common across the world. In medieval Europe, the cost of, leave, of leaving Christianity could be huge to the individual attempting it. But here's something requiring explanation. There has been a divergence in religious freedoms across the two uh, regions. State-enforced punishment for apostasy or heresy became a thing of the past in Europe. It's still alive in the Middle East. Why this divergence? Again, some interpreters will say, will look straight to the to Islam as a religion. They'll say Islam bans exits, that the Quran denies religious freedoms. But Islamic scriptures don't unequivocally bar out conversions or novel religious viewpoints. The Quran's relevant verses are all subject to interpretation. So Islamic apostasy blasphemy and heresy rules could have evolved in the direction of broadening tolerance and uh, liberties. If they didn't, it's because critical events during Islam's initial few decades narrowed acceptable discourses on these concepts, especially on apostasy. Major historical precedents exist because uh, discourses on apostasy, blasphemy, and heresy were so constrained, precedents exist for intolerant, illiberal, uh, and illiberal interpretations of Islam. Does this make the broadening of Muslim religious freedoms impossible, one might ask? Well, no, precedents don't carve patterns in stone. Christianity, too, has a history of punishing alleged sinners and uh, leavers. Yet predominantly Christian Europe liberalized in many areas, including religion. Why hasn't this happened in Islam? It's not obvious why, especially because as in Christian Europe, the Middle East has had sustained movements to cut down the powers of clerics. Seculariz secularization in the early Turkish Republic uh, is the boldest of these movements, but the 20th century saw other ambitious campaigns in Iran, Tunisia, 
uh, Egypt, among other Arab countries. The Middle East secular regimes might have facilitated exits from Islam. They might have reinterpreted the Quran or commissioned reinterpretations of the Quran. They might have broadened religious freedoms generally, expecting to benefit themselves. Well, instead, they simply made it easy to ignore Islam. Their ideal was to have citizens disconnect themselves from religion, and they believed, in line with fashionable variants of modernization theory, that religion would fade away through economic development anyway. So it eventually would become a non-issue if they could, if they just pushed religion out of the public square uh, in the meantime. At any rate, secular Middle Eastern regimes persecuted the, the pious who insisted on bringing religion into the public square, and they constricted discourses on modernizing Islam. They succeeded for a while in pushing religion outside the view of ruling elites, outside their own views, partly through oppression, but religion did not fade. On the contrary, it became a refuge for all sorts of dissenters. The, the widespread discontent that emerged through decades of secular repression paved the way for regimes led by Islamists of one kind or another. Turkey's current regime is one example. The Islamic, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, is, uh, is another. These are both partly consequences of uh, long secularist repression. Now this religious repression, religious counter repression account goes part of the way in explaining the extreme weakness of religious freedoms in the, in the uh, Middle East, but there's more to it and it involves the organizational handicaps I talked about earlier. New religious interpretations need not come from the top. So the lack of state interest in reinterpreting Islam during the uh, uh, secularist era or later doesn't explain fully why one or more liberal variants haven't emerged from below anywhere in the Arab world or Iran or, uh, or Turkey. Innumerable varieties of Christianity, including many liberal ones, have emerged through bottom-up initiatives. In Eastern Europe, in the 1800s, a relatively liberal variant of uh, Judaism, Reform Judaism, emerged without state involvement. Curiously, there's been no Islamic counterpart to liberal branches of Protestantism or to Reform Judaism. It's not for lack of Muslims who find various Islamic practices outdated and Islamic teachings misguided. There are huge constituencies going into tens of millions in the Middle East who object to Islamic rules on gender matters and on family. There's wide dissatisfaction with certain Islamic rituals. There are objections to many bans enforced in the name of Islam. Uh, the, uh, the liturgy draws a lot of objections. Well, ongoing religious tensions within the Middle East hint that more tolerant, more permissive, and liberalized variants of Islam are in store. If we don't see liberal schisms yet, this is partly because of collective action difficulties rooted in the chronic weaknesses of civil society. Now, a reinforcing factor is the potency of the apostasy charge, uh, which preserves the appearance of a unified Muslim community through fear. Potential members of a liberal variant of Islam lack a comparably effective ideological instrument. Precisely because they have a liberal view of religion, they're reluctant to use force to get their way. Becoming non-religious, just moving away from, from Islam, seems more, uh, more prudent to, to millions. So here's a puzzle within the bigger puzzle that Freedom's Delay addresses. Over the past century, extremely restrictive 
radically tolerant forms of Islam, new forms of Islam have emerged. Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood is one example. ISIS in Iraq and Syria is, is another. These movements, these very these puritanical and uh, violent movements have no qualms about using force and of accusing their opponents of apost apostasy and blasphemy. No comparable liberal schism has occurred anywhere in the, uh, the Middle East. Because liberals are inherently opposed to using force, they're at a disadvantage vis-a-vis restrictive forms of Islam. So let me sum up. I've described the two clusters of mechanisms that hinder liberalization in the Middle East. These are mutually reinforcing in a lot of ways that I haven't had time to go uh, into. The weakness of civil society limits the capacity to get organized for liberalizing Islam. And in turn, Religious repression limits the options of civic organizations that do exist in a wide variety of uh, areas. Thank you, Timur. You've worked on various of these issues over the last years and published papers. So when and why did you decide to write a book? It's been a while, uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, it's hard to believe. I set out to write a book that would resolve a pair of puzzles. One was that the Middle East had become economically underdeveloped, though it wasn't economically behind a few centuries ago. And the other puzzle was that the Middle East was politically underdeveloped uh, in the sense of being mostly undemocratic. Now it's completely undemocratic, but also illiberal, which it still is, uh, though it wasn't obviously more repressive before recent centuries. I had a vague sense that certain traditional institutions grounded in Islamic law had both adverse long-term economic effects and adverse long-term political effects. As I started to weave my thoughts into an analytical narrative, it seemed that the book would become too unwieldy. There would be too many mechanisms to keep track of, and the end product would be a 1,000-page uh, book of use mainly as a doorstopper. People uh, wouldn't read uh, such a tome. So I decided to tackle the economic puzzle first because my thinking was more advanced on the economic side. I felt on a more secure footing. The result was my 2011 book, the Long Divergence, How Islamic Law Held Back the, the Middle East. It took 12 more years to produce in fits and starts the sequel, which is the political counterpart of the first book. For better or for worse, uh, that's of course for you and others to judge, my goal set in 20, uh, 2003 is now uh, achieved. Thanks, Timur. So you mentioned the two books you wrote. Can you mention the common source between the two, how the books are related? Uh, so certainly. The long divergence identifies several Islamic institutions that served the Middle East very well in Europe's Middle Ages in the sense of making it a prosperous part of the globe. Only China might have had higher living standards. But over the long run, these institutions turned into economic handicaps. They denied the Middle East the dynamism that Europe's economic institutions generated. Institutional change from within was not entirely absent for, uh, from the Middle East, but when it occurred, when institutional changes did occur, new markets emerged and so on, the innovations were less of a break with the past than European institutional innovations. The modern economy was born in Europe, and like most parts of the world, the Middle East transplanted modern economic institutions and replaced uh, its uh, institutions, uh, economic institutions grounded in Islamic law. The Islamic institutions that reduced the Middle East 
institutional dynamism included Islamic partnership law or Islamic contract law, uh, the Islamic inheritance uh, system, and Islam's distinct form of the trust, the work, which we've already talked about. Now, in making the Middle East an economic laggard, these same institutions also kept the Middle East from liberalizing politically, socially, and in its understanding of, of Islam. In other words, they turned into political handicaps as well. So let's take the, uh, the WAQ first, because a WAQ's resources were to be used in principle forever, as the founder stipulated, it became economically inefficient over time. Sometimes it took a decade, sometimes a century, but eventually it became inefficient. It could not adapt, at least not optimally, to new technologies or changing relative uh, prices. Precisely because a walk governed a quote, was governed according to a fixed document, the intended beneficiaries of its services had no meaningful power over what it did, even if they recognized that adaptations were needed to changing relative prices or, or technologies or uh, outside uh, some exogenous uh, shock. The intended beneficiaries of a hospital that was established as a walk, uh, who, are, who are the intended beneficiaries, potentially sick people in its neighborhood, they could not make the hospital responsive to changes in medical knowledge. They were passive recipients of the hospital services who were to accept with gratitude whatever care the hospital uh, offered. Not only that, the caretaker or the trustee of the hospital was under no obligation to share with the hospital's users information about the hospital's finances or about how it was run who got priority in treatment, what sorts of requests were being made about to, to change medical technologies or to uh, change, uh, change the way uh, the hospital's resources are, are spent. Beneficiaries were just completely in the dark. There was no forum also for them to gather periodically and evaluate the quality of the hospital's services by pooling their, uh, uh, their information. For these reasons, the hospital users did not get organized. They didn't form a civic organization to serve as their collective voice in pressuring the hospital to keep up with the times, to say nothing of everyone in a city or everyone in an, in an empire getting together to monitor and uh, put pressure on hospitals to keep them, uh, uh, to make them keep up with modern technology. Now imagine this civic passivity repeating itself across thousands of public services in a big city like Istanbul or Cairo or a big uh, uh, state like the Ottoman Empire. These centers like Istanbul or Cairo won't generate civic organizations to keep them efficient. Civil society will remain anemic for these reasons alone. So let's consider another core economic institution, the Islamic Partnership. Uh, Islamic partnerships were used to establish elementary enterprises that pooled labor with capital. They were ephemeral and tiny, often composed of a single capital provider and a single worker for cooperation expected to last a few months. The Islamic partnership was renewable, as you might ex uh, expect, and many were renewed you know, again and again and again for, uh, uh, for a decade or more. But because of Islam's relatively very egalitarian inheritance system, the Islamic partnership was not scalable. So it didn't spawn more advanced forms of business capable of pooling growing amounts of capital with growing amounts of uh, growing numbers of workers. That made the Middle East institutionally unprepared for the institutional revolution. Now, that's the an economic consequence, a major unintended economic uh, consequence of Islamic partnership law developed uh, 
uh, by the uh, by the turn of the first millennium, the, the Middle East atomistic private economic sectors had political effects as well, though. They kept private businesses politically weak. In Europe, meanwhile, giant firms did form. Merchants and producers gained power over time. This is reflected in the seats they started gaining in European parliaments. There's no counterpart in the Middle East to the political ascent of European traders and uh, merchants and bankers in the, in the 17th century than industrialists in the 19th century. The political weaknesses of private economic sectors meant that many socially, economically, uh, economically important decisions were made without much input from critical producers of wealth. So to sum up, key Islamic institutions that took center stage in the economic analysis in the long divergence had adverse long-term effects on the Middle East political development as well. And these adverse political effects are analyzed in Freedom Select. What is your favorite part in the book, if there is any? Uh, there is a part of the book that I consider particularly important to the future of the Middle East, as well as global politics. For that reason, it's my favorite. Let me start with some context. When Freedom's Delayed was at the planning stage, I expected to cover religious repression in two chapters. The published book contains five chapters focused on religious repression. This is partly because in researching, I discovered fascinating evidence that societies that look highly religious to casual observers are becoming much less religious. In Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, and Turkey, contrary to popular thought, popular perceptions, people are becoming less religious. And substantial numbers are exiting Islam privately while outwardly remaining pious Muslims, even to the extent of attending Friday services uh, uh, regularly uh, and celebrating uh, uh, Muslim holidays. I've had a professional interest in preference falsification for uh, a long time. So I was prepared for finding that in the region's repressive societies, public religious beliefs need not match private religious uh, beliefs, but the extent of this preference falsification surprised me. Readers, too, will find, I think, the evidence intriguing. In recent waves of the World Values Survey, which is uh, run through the University of Michigan, 15% of Middle Easterners reveal that they're either not religious or atheist, far more than meets the eye. The actual share is probably higher because in repressive environments, people don't trust pollsters on sensitive issues. And of course, non-religiosity and atheism are, are very sensitive issues in the region. Leaked surveys by government agencies also point to disillusionment with government-promoted variants of Islam. In Turkey, they suggest that there's been a big shift among youths from Islam to deism, and a 40% fall in just the last decade in people who consider themselves pious and conservative. In Egypt, clerics are so alarmed by the decline in religiosity that they won't let World Values Survey ask a question about belief in, in God. An official survey that was leaked by a former Grand Mufti the highest religious official uh, in the land until recently found the atheist share to be 12.5% of Egyptians, which doesn't include the non-religious. 
such polling data plus ethnographic uh, data led me to ask a question that to my knowledge had not been asked directly and certainly not investigated in depth. I uh, spent two chapters investigating why, in spite of signs of widespread religious dissatisfaction under the surface, and in spite of so many reservations about specific Islamic practices, we haven't yet seen a schism reflected, reflective of people's concerns. The potential for a more permissive, modernized, and more tolerant variant of Islam exists. There's no question about that. The fact that it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it can't. These observations, I think, have global significance, yet they're lost among all the bad news about Islamic terrorism, about uh, beheadings, about things the Taliban is, is doing, uh, uh, bombings by ISIS, uh, and, and so on, tensions involving uh, Muslim migrants in, in Europe, and so on. Freedoms delayed explains many failures of the Middle East, but it also provides hope. Because various forms of liberalism are all interconnected, broad liberalization can start anywhere. And when we look at Euro European liberalization uh, processes, we see that their starting points can uh, can differ. The weights played by uh, by merchants or by churches and so on these these could could vary across uh, societies. So I mean, what we what we uh, learn from uh, from European uh, political history as well as uh, the political history of other regions is that liberalization can start with the state, it can start with religion, it can start with schools, it can start with markets. It won't surprise me if liberalization in the, in the Middle East starts of all places with religion. I say of all places because conventional wisdom, as I pointed out right at the beginning of this podcast, holds Islam as a religion responsible for illiberalism, right? Beyond religion, that it's the major, that Islam is the major block to liberalization on various uh, uh, fronts. What I'm suggesting is the possibility of liberalization starting with, uh, with Islam. Notice that the book is called Freedoms Delayed and not Freedoms Denied. There's no fix to oppression in the, in the region. That I would grant. Uh, if liberalization starts, it would probably not be a, a bloodless uh, affair. Uh, there would be resistance. Checks and balances can't be installed overnight, whether checks and balances that come from civic society or uh, the, the formal kind uh, uh, that democracies have. But the glass is not uh, empty. Thank you, Timur. Um, we can conclude with the last question, just a curiosity. Um, what do you think uh, non-economies will find most interesting about your most recent book? Let me mention something that non-economists will find uh, quite interesting, but economists as well. I, I, I don't think they would find it uh, boring. In numerous contexts, the book shows that distant history matters to the present. Institutions developed more than a millennium millennium ago have had profound consequences that have outlived the institutions themselves. All readers will be interested in the book's argument that defunct Islamic institutions constrain Middle Eastern possibilities. They will understand, I hope, after reading the, the book, why the Arab Spring was unlikely to endure. It was in the first few centuries of Islam, 622 to about the year 1000, the key features of Islamic law were constructed 
out of templates available in the region. But Islamic jurisprudence were selective in what they borrowed. They borrowed from neighboring civilizations the trust, but not the corporation that was available, at least in, in Roman lands. For more than a millennium, the Islamic form of the trust, the, the rock, kept civil society weak, as I've uh, explained. The Islamic rock is gone, and a law of corporations, something that wasn't borrowed uh, in, the, uh, in the early centuries of, of Islam, uh, it exists now in every single country of the region. But the weaknesses of civic life endure. Various types of repression that we observe in the Middle East all bear the influences of the distant uh, past. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timur. That was amazing. And we had the great pleasure of reading the book uh, ahead of its publication. It's now out, right, on sale in various countries. And it's available as an ebook. The uh, the hardback will be out on August uh, 4th uh, in Europe and by late October in North, uh, North America and the rest of uh, uh, the world somewhere between those uh, those dates. Uh, so yes, the book is available in, in one of the three formats and the paperback is to be in 12 to 18 months. Excellent. Thanks again for coming on the podcast today and wishing you all the best and hope to see you soon again in the future. Take care, Timur. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ash, and thanks, Timur. See you at the next one.